I'm still fighting this cold, and that's why I'm not going to shake hands with anybody tonight. Uh, I really wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, and uh, that's why if it looks like my nose is shining, it's because I got Vaseline all over it, and my lips, and <laughs> my lips are chapped, and my nose from blowing it so much, and, and you know, I, I'm the type that goes, I'm sick. I'm going to go sweat it out, you know? So I got on my bicycle and, you know, just really pushed it hard. Well, that didn't do nothing except make me sicker, so... Um, uh, that didn't work. We're going to be in Second Peter chapter three tonight. Second Peter three. A couple of things. First of all, please be in prayer for the Harbaugh, Harbaugh family. Annette's son, Paul Fowler, passed away, and uh, that service is going to be at two o'clock at Stewart's funeral home. Um, the visitation is at twelve thirty, uh, an hour and a half before at Stewart's also. So I know that they would appreciate your prayers. Also, we've got a lot of neat things coming up. This coming uh, Sunday, we've got Dr. Michael Rodelnik, who's going to be coming. And uh, he's going to be doing a book signing. He's going to be doing a, a, a Messiah in the Passover is basically what it's called. And it's a presentation sermon that I'm really excited. I've been trying to get him to do it for years. And finally, he couldn't do it. We didn't have time to set up three times in the other building. So as soon as we got in here, I said, okay, you got to come. So he's, he's going to be doing it. Uh, he'll be signing some books. If you'd like to purchase some of those books, uh, they're really, really great. And it's neat when you get somebody to sign a book that you have in your library. So he's coming Sunday. Uh, this coming Sunday at 5 p.m., there's a motorcycle meeting. So if you're interested in, you know, being part of a Christian motorcycle group of guys, uh, that's going to be held in A114. I had said that we're going to have a decision counselors meeting at 5.30, but I'd really like to postpone that. So we're going to do that the 14th. My decision counselors, you should be receiving an email uh, to remind you of this, but I'm telling you now, we can't do it this Sunday night at 5.30, so we're going to try to do it on the 14th of April at 5.30, also in the conference room. So anyway, I hate that, but we have to. Had 380 for supper tonight. That's good. Amen. It's a lot of meatloaf, isn't it? Praise the Lord, man. I can't wait meatloaf tonight. That's good. I, I really look forward to meatloaf like meat, meatloaf tonight. Can't even say it. Uh, please be in prayer for our Bible drillers. They were supposed to be going to Euless this coming weekend to compete, and we're very proud of them. And uh, our Encore is going to be going to Nacogdoches on April the 11th. Encore is our senior adult ministry. And if you consider yourself a senior adult, 55 and above, and would like to participate, you're more than welcome. Boy, they would love to have you. They have a lot of good uh, fellowships and, and uh, outings and, you know, retreats and stuff like that. So Encore will be going to Nacogdoches April the 11th. April the 12th is Women's Ministry Spring Celebration. That will be in the Christian Life Center. Uh, Easter Family Fun Day. So if you have children that want to come up and enjoy, you know, the festivities of Easter, the intermediate will be meeting on the 12th, and the, those lower grades up to third grade will have theirs on Saturday at the church. So you can check the website, you can check some of the deals about exactly the times that are happening. And then the water filter training coming up uh, April the 7th from 4 to 6 in the Outback. So this coming Sunday afternoon, if you would like to be a part of the water filter training, you're going to be going on a mission trip and you're going to be witnessing to people using this water filter. You need to know how it works. You need to know how to witness with it. And this is a great training time. So we really want you to be there. And uh, what a blessing though, you know, to be able to give people clean water and the gospel at the same time. Easter is April the 21st. Woo! We are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Woo! We are going to have Sunday school. Woo! So that's, I mean, what a joy, amen? Come on, Sunday school teachers, you ought to, boy, that's a knockout punch. Just pow. Um, that's a great opportunity. You know, some people come to church on Easter and never come any other time. Boy, you better strike while the iron's hot. You have people come to your Sunday school class, you ought, to, you ought to take their names if they're visiting. You ought to follow up on those contacts and, 
and get back with them and say, listen, boy, we're glad you're here. We want you back. And uh, don't just be an Easter bunny. You come on and, you know, love Jesus with the rest of us. So we are having Sunday school, but we are not having Sunday evening services. By that time, we are all thoroughly thrashed. And many of you have family coming in, and the crowd has always been historically extremely low on Easter night. So uh, we're going to give you that evening at home with your family. So yes, we are having Sunday school. No, we are not having Sunday evening services. Yes, we are going to have a lot of people here. Amen? Now, if you're impaired, if you have a hard time walking, uh, we want you to have the good parking spaces. If you're not, don't come up here and hog the best parking spaces, okay? So quiet. Don't tell me that. We're going to have a lot of people here. And I, I'm, you know, the staff is, is told, you don't get a good parking space. You can, you can get a crummy one. So park out in the North 40. and uh, Let's let our visitors have some nice parking spaces if we possibly can, okay? Because we, we, this is a time we may not get another opportunity. So we're at Second Peter chapter 3. If you would, please stand in honor of God's word. Boy, this is, this is so, so good. Uh, I'm so excited. I, I just really hope my voice holds out. And even if it doesn't, then I'll just horse it up, okay, and be horse. We're going to look at verse 8. No, let's back up. Let's back up. Let's go to verse 3. Ready? Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they were willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that was, then was being overflowed with water perished. I'm talking about the Noah flood, Okay. And, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance." Don't y'all think that's a great place for an amen? amen? That God desires for all to come to repentance. He wants everybody to be saved. But, in contrast, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens shall be on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So let's bow for a word of prayer. God, thank you so very much, God, for opening our eyes to, to what's coming. I pray, God, that you will give us good sense to react to it, I thank you for how you've already been dealing with our hearts and, and God, how this marvelous book that you laid on Peter's heart has just literally jumped off the page into our hearts. Oh, God, there's so much stuff going on around here. I pray that we will not take our focus off of you. We love you. We truly do. And God, when we come to worship, we are not here to entertain each other. We're here just to recognize your unseen presence. And we believe by faith, oh God, that you are here. God, that when we sang just a few minutes ago, that we were singing before your presence. God, that as we pray, we're entering into your very throne room. Oh God, I pray that you be with our children, be with our leaders, be with our nursery. Please be with our youth. Please be with those that are uh, in our choir that are practicing for Sunday. Thank you, God, for those that help prepare our food tonight. And may you be glorified by this service this evening, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, so a, a quick review. 
Peter has just finished saying that in the last days, scoffers will not believe four things, okay? And he's going to mention these. And this is written 2,000 years ago, so he's going to let you know ahead of time what scoffers are not going to believe. Number one, they will not believe that God created the heaven and the earth. They will scoff and say God did not speak the world into existence. Listen to 2 Peter 3, 5. For this they are willingly ignorant. In other words, they choose to be ignorant. They don't want to know the evidence. They are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old. In other words, the Bible says that God spoke the worlds into existence. Hebrews 11.3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were made were not made of things which do appear. In other words, we believe that God spoke and the world came into existence. Okay? In the last days, the Bible says there will be scoffers that do not believe that. Now, here's the thing. Whether you believe in evolution or creationism, either way, you're making a faith decision based on the best evidence you can find or what you've been taught. Some would say, well, evolution is a fact. No, it's not. Some would say creation is a fact. No, it's not. Because the definition of a scientific fact is the ability to take the information into a laboratory and recreate the event numerous times with the same result. That's the definition of a scientific fact. Anything else is a theory or a hypothesis. Can I hear an amen to that? So, so let's get this straight. What is a fact? A fact is something that you can go into the laboratory and you can recreate that event over and over and over again and get the same results. You can't recreate creation. You, nobody can go into the laboratory and, and, and they certainly can't go in and recreate evolution. They have not. They would love to be able to, but they can't. Therefore, there are no defined facts by definition. What you do is you take the very best evidence that you can and you have to come to a faith-based conclusion. That's what you do. I wish on Sunday I could have talked more about the eyeball. Were y'all here for the eyeball? Was that fun? I love doing stuff like that. I don't want to do it all the time, but every now and then, boy, just really get on a body part or a bug or a bird or something like that and, and just really get into it. I, I could have gone for about an hour, but I didn't. But here are a couple other things I want to share with you guys, okay, about the eyeball and the miracle of design, of how it was designed by an intelligent being. We believe that's God. Uh, the eyeball is surrounded by these incredible tear ducts that not only allow us to cry, which is really great because... Uh, Man, that's, that's a willing way that we can express our grief in times of great sorrow, but that lubricate our eyes, and it's such a necessity, and it's such a blessing. Amen? That God's given us these tear ducts that, that produce just the right fluid. It's not just any fluid. It's just the right fluid that is able to lubricate and to cleanse your eyes the way God would have them to be cleansed. Um, inside your eyes also, though, is something akin to a gyroscope, okay? And what it does is it allows you, even though you're moving, to focus on one person or one face. So that when you do this, the whole landscape is not doing this. You can focus. Because if every time you move like this, that everything else went up and down like that, what you would end up being is you couldn't stand up straight. You would be like a drunken sailor out in the middle of the sea, rocking back and forth, unable to stand up. But God has put a gyroscope inside your eyes so that even though you're moving around, you can keep the focus right there. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's how a cheetah can run so fast. Its head never moves. Its eyes are focused on the prey and everything else is going here. And it's not, but the head is perfectly, the eyes are focused. It's a miracle, literally a miracle. 
the inner skin of the eyelid is almost as miraculous as the eyeball itself because that's a unique piece of skin that's not like any other skin on your body that folds down and comes back up and it's perfectly designed to take the tears and to wash your eyes and to collect the dirt and bring it back off. And you've got a muscle that not only closes your eyes, but then opens them. And you do this four million to five million times a year and you never think about it. You will now. So you got a muscle, is it pushing or is it pulling? Is it pulling up or is it pushing down? And, and it's just incredible how God has designed this phenomenal eye, so well designed. If you're much on um, taking pictures, you know that back in the days that we used to use film, you would have to determine what kind of film you wanted to put in your camera. And that was oftentimes determined by the speed so you would have a 32 speed if you were going to take somebody's portrait. And you set them on a stool and you said, okay, sit real still. We're going to get great detail. So you've got to sit still. And you would use what's called 32 speed uh, film. Very hard to get. Usually you get in a portrait studio. That's what they would use. The normal film that you would put in a camera, a 35 millimeter camera, was 100 ASA or 100 speed. And that was pretty well the norm. That could take a picture of most things. But if you were a sports writer and you were going to go on a football field and you were going to take a picture of that running back running like this, if you used 100 or 32, you were going to get nothing but a big blur. So you would use a faster speed film, which was called 400 ASA. And if they were really running fast, you'd use a 1,000 speed ASA, 1,000 ASA in your camera. Isn't it amazing that you don't have to change the film in your retina? That God has made it where that light is focused through your cornea, it goes through the pupil, it's refocused by the lens, it goes through the eye goo. You know there's eye goo inside your eyeball. And it, and it is projected on the back of your eyeball inside. And the retina has over 130 million photosensitive cells that transform that light image into electrical stimulus that goes to the optic nerve, that goes to the brain, that tells you what you've just seen. And you know, I was thinking about this as I was driving to church today, just driving down the road and looking at the blue bonnets and the Indian paintbrushes and, and the little white flowers. I don't know what they are. We used to gather them for a mother back a long time ago. The grass, the trees, the cows, the horses, uh, whether it's a baby cow or, or, or a big bull. or I mean, and, and just looking at the trees and, and the road, and believe it or not, I was looking at traffic coming the other direction. And, uh, but it's absolutely miraculous that every photo that your eye is taking, and they're taking thousands per second, and sending that information back to your brain is registering, and you're able to react to it so much so that as you're looking at the flowers and stuff, guess if, if, a, if a bug were to fly at your face, you, that's how fast you can react. And then you've got the orbital bones around the eye that provide a socket for the eye to fit into, and it protects the eye. You've got fluid and the correct pressure regulation of the fluid in the eyeball, and that's miraculous because that keeps you from getting glaucoma because when you go get an eye test and they say, look in this thing, and you go, okay, you know, because you're ignorant, and you look in it and they take a BB gun and go, <laughs> and you take that test, that glaucoma test, they're checking the pressure in your, inside your eyeball because it's got to be the right pressure or you can't see. And then they're going to do the second one. You're going, I'm not opening my eye for you on the second one. It's absolutely amazing. And the eyeball is nothing but the size of a marble with all that stuff in it. By faith, I truly believe that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. Created by God that is an all-knowing genius with a merciful heart. Wow, what a God we serve that is worthy of our worship. And that's just our eye. That's just one eye. The neat thing is we've got two of them. 
The scoffers will say, God didn't do that. That just happened. Even though Darwin himself comes up and says, to think of all the things that an eyeball could do, and this is before he ever knew about the 130 million photoreceptors in the back of the retina. This is before he, he said, it's literally absurd to think that the eye can form by natural selection. So even the father of evolution doesn't believe it. But the scoffers will laugh at you if you believe in creation or intelligent design. And that's even at Christian schools. Second, they will not believe that God destroyed the world by a flood in the days of Noah. Listen again to 2 Peter 3, 5. And the earth standing out of water and in the water, whereby the world that was then was being overflowed with water perished. The scoffers will say, there wasn't a flood. Oh, not making that up. The Grand Canyon happened because there was a river going through it for millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years. When a worldwide flood perfectly would form something like the Grand Canyon. The scoffers deny it. At the same time, third, they do not believe that a judgment by fire is just around the corner. So they didn't believe that there was a judgment and they don't believe that a judgment is coming. So listen to verse seven. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So what they're saying is in the last days, their scoffers said, God did not judge people by flood and he's not about to judge people by fire. So who would be the people doing that? Well, it's the people that don't want their behavior judged. I guess if I were dancing in a gay pride parade, I wouldn't want there to be judgment coming either. If we truly believe that an unsaved sinner is on the verge of stepping off into an eternity of ruin in the lake of fire, we would not be having gay pride parade dates. If we truly believe that God was gonna judge next by fire and that he had previously done it by water, we would not be overwhelmed and swimming in the consumption of liquor. We would not have 6,000 churches a year closing in the United States if we truly believe judgment was on the cusp. But what a new generation is saying is, listen, I don't wanna hear a sermon on fire and brimstone. But that's what the scripture says. Well, what am I supposed to do? Skip this part? Not talk about the lake of fire? But the Bible says in the last days, the scoffers will say that that's not true. That's not gonna happen. I believe it is. So if you wanna call this a hell of fire and brimstone sermon, I guess you can. And some people might say, well, you, that's using fear to motivate, motivate people. Well, we should be afraid. Anybody with bat sense ought to be afraid of the coming judgment, amen? <laughs> You're just trying to use fear. Duh! More about that in a second. The fourth thing scoffers will scoff at is the preaching and teaching about the return of Christ. So we go back into verse three and the Bible says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, where's the promise of his coming? But Sam's preaching about a rapture. Where's the rapture gonna happen? He just talking. He'd been talking about that for years. Well, it's that much closer, amen? So let's jump to verse eight because that's exactly, I mean, uh, churches aren't preaching the second coming and churches aren't preaching hellfire and brimstone. They're not preaching the judgment that was, the judgment to come, and, and they're not preaching the return of Christ. Uh, sad to say. I wish they were. They ought to be, uh, but they're not. And, and the behavior of our society proves it, okay? So let's jump to verse eight and because and, that's kind of review. And he says, but beloved, uh, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. So we're gonna look at the timeline of God. Now, a couple of things. First of all, you understand that God is not confined to our space-time continuum. 
God was before all things. He was before time. You're confined to the space-time continuum that we're in. In other words, you're going to sit there and look at your watch and go, uh, there's 60 seconds in a minute. There's 60 minutes in an hour. And this sucker's dragging. <laughs> no, you're not. You're going, oh, I just can't believe you're already done, Brother Sam. You go so fast. Uh, Whether you think it's going fast or you think it's going slow, 60 seconds is 60 seconds. 60 minutes is 60 minutes. It's an hour. And the only thing that's going to change that is if you can go the speed of light, then time slows down. But you're not able to go the speed of light, so time's not going to slow down. So we're all confined to this space-time continuum. But God is not because God's the creator of space-time and, and uh, matter. Amen? And, and, and it says it in the very first verse, in the beginning, that's time. God started time. In the beginning, God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, that's matter. So God put all this together, and he's outside of that. He's not regulated by that. So he comes up and says that um, a, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a, a thousand years is as one day. Uh, because in God's eyes, a millennium can be as short as a day. Some of us think, God, why are you taking forever to answer my prayer? Why are you taking forever to avenge those Christians who have died for the faith? God, why are you taking forever to heal me? Why are you taking forever to take me home or my mother home? But God doesn't look at time the way we look at time. He steps outside of time. So the second thing we would say about this is, this may be giving us a clue to the overall timetable of God's plan. Now, I'm not a date setter. I don't do that kind of stuff. But I do know there's a special thing in the Bible about the number seven, amen? Seven is the number of completion. There are seven days in a week. Amen? That completes a week. Uh, there were seven days in creation. After the sixth day, God rested on the seventh day. That completed creation. On Dan in Daniel chapter nine, the Bible uh, says the angel Gabriel talked to Daniel and said, it is appointed for 77s. And after that, we will finish the transgression and the Messiah will be crowned and seated. So what completes that? Well, 77s. So there's something special about the seven. Every seventh day was the Sabbath day. It was the day of rest. Every seventh year was to be a sabbatical year, a year of rest and release to start over again. And then after seven Seven-year periods of time, you would celebrate the 50th year, which was the Jubilee. Amen? And you'd usually have one of those in a lifetime. Now, I'm not dogmatic. Certainly, I'm not setting dates. But it's believed that from Adam getting kicked out of the garden until Jesus was right at about 4,000 years. Okay? By biblical standards, 4,000. And from Jesus to now, it's about 2,000. So if I know my John Tyler math, that 4,000 plus 2,000 equals 6,000. Men? And then we know that there's a thousand year millennium in there, which we have not come to. So, I, you know, you could make a case to say we may be getting pretty close to Jesus coming back and setting up his millennial kingdom. If indeed God goes by that seven, and, and, he, and that's what he's saying listen, a year, I mean, a day can be like a thousand years for me. It doesn't really make a difference. So, uh, that, that's something interesting to think about. So he says, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So if seven days complete a week, 7,000 years may complete this era. Uh, then he comes up and says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why is he waiting? Why didn't he split up in the eastern sky and come get me? Waiting for that last person to get saved. I mean, God, God desires for everybody to come to repentance. Uh, it may be for you to be able to go that mission trip because we've got so much work to do, you know. I mean, we sit here and, and, and we, we think, man, God's doing a great work. At you. Let me tell you something. The fields are white and the harvest, my dear friend. There's so many lost people. There's so many lost people down in Belize that, that need pastors that, 
those pastors need to go to a Bible college that, that, that in Guatemala. They, they need clean water and, and they need Jesus. There, there's so many people in Honduras and then in the Amazon basin of Brazil and over in the Philippines and in Cuba and over where Scott and those guys are at and where Brother Matt was in Africa. I'm, I'm telling you, the fields are wide unto harvest. And we need to be reaching those folks because it's God's desire. If it's God's desire, it ought to be our desire that none that none would perish. Amen? Amen. Now look at this, because you, you, you got something I want you to see. It's a bookend, okay? And it's an important bookend. He says, verse 10, uh, but the day of the Lord, okay? So you need to underline that in your Bible and pay attention to it, because I'm going to share something with you here in a second. We've talked about the day of the Lord on multiple times, all right? And we know what the definition of the day of the Lord is. The day of the Lord is basically, and I'm going to pull this coat off. The day of the Lord is when God finally says, that's enough. You've taken my name in vain once too often. That's enough. You've showed a dirty movie once too often. That's enough. You've called me a liar and robbed me of my glory by telling the whole world that I did not create the heaven and the earth, I've had enough. And you know, there comes a point where everybody, no matter how merciful and gracious you are, you come to this point and you go, that's enough. I'm not taking anymore. You, you, you've called me a liar once too often. You've cursed and used my name. Why don't you use Buddha's name or Muhammad's name, but you always use my name when you call it out in vain. When you're frustrated, you use my son's name. And I've had enough. I'm not taking any more. You, you think I'm incapable of judging you. And you've mistaken my capability with patience. I've been patient, but my patience has run out. And the Bible says there's coming a day that that patience will end, and it's called the day of the Lord. We've talked about this, and I want to tell you something. Listen to me very carefully, okay? If you have a position, eschatology, about the second coming of Christ or the rapture. And you've established that position without having done a personal study by yourself on the day of the Lord, then I would say that your study is incomplete. Let me say that again. If you go, oh, but I'm gonna tell you something. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. It's the imminent return of Christ to happen next. My question would be to you, have you studied yourself that verbiage, the day of the Lord? No, but my preacher tells you. Then you need to go back and study. I'm telling you, you better go back and study. You better find out for yourself. You better look. Because it's not just off the cuff. We know that that phrase, the day of the Lord, is mentioned in the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Amos, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Malachi, Obadiah, Acts, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. It's also mentioned in Matthew and in the book of Revelation. You cannot overlook that. Now, here's what he's doing, okay? He's going to give you bookends. He says, but there's coming a day, though God is merciful and desires that none would perish, but there's coming a day. And it's called the day of the Lord. It's a day of darkness. It's a day of judgment where God goes, I've had enough. And he's going to bookend it. This is great. Listen to this. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Front part of the bookend. It's, it's almost like you're at a track meet and you're waiting for the gun to go off. Now, before the track meet and you get there and they say, all right, we're going to have the big race and you're in that race and, and you're out there going... Oh. Like I would know, I never ran a race. I mean, I was way too slow for that. But I'd watch them. I watched them on TV, and they shake, and they you know bend down, and 
do this and grab the foot and hold it for a while, and then go down and back up, and, you know, just, and, 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 and they know it's getting time. It's getting close, so they're getting ready. And then and they say, all right, runners, you need to get on your marks. And they, they get in those things, and they get all set, and they put their fingers just right, and, and, they, and they're just waiting for the gun to go off. Pow! And then the race begins. So he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So where else do we see this phrase? Well, we see the same phrase in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. So I'm going to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter, chapter 4, back up a little bit, and give you the context, okay? For when does the day of the Lord start according to Scripture? 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. For this we say by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep or those that have died. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. What is that? What is that event? That's the rapture, amen? That's the rapture. That's, that's when the dead in Christ are gonna come up out of the grave and the church is gonna meet the Lord there. Jesus isn't coming back at that time. He is not coming back on the white stallion with King of Kings, Lord of Lords, where he establishes his reign. He comes and gets the church and we meet him in the sky. Get this. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But at the times and season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Huh, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? So when's it starting? Well, it seems like it starts with the rapture. That's what he just described. For when they shall say peace and safety, when the scoffers are saying he's not coming back, it's not gonna happen, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. So we've got some prior warning. Not only here, but I believe the Holy Spirit's saying, have you read 2 Peter? It gives you the bookends. It tells you. Then the last day, they're going to be scoffers. When you hear scoffers, you better get ready. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all children of the light. You're children of the day. You're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The race is about to start. You're seeing the signs take place, and you can stand there waving at your girlfriend up in the stands. <laughs> while everybody else is in the blocks. And when the gun goes off, you're gonna be about 30 feet behind before it ever gets started. We ought to be on the line getting ready for the pistol to fire. Because pow, when the rapture occurs, it starts the day of the Lord. So what concludes the day of the Lord? If that's the first book in, what's the second book in? What ends it? What concludes it? Well, he tells us, in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burn up. So does that happen at the rapture? No, it does not. You know that. In fact, what the Bible says is that after the rapture occurs, then, then God's wrath begins to fall on the earth. The, 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 the trumpets of wrath begin to fall. A third of all the green grass and the trees burn up. A third of the fresh water is undrinkable. A third of, of the sea dies. Then the seven vials of wrath begin to be poured out. And at the end of this, the Bible says Jesus gets on his white horse and all his army, and that's us, we're going to get on our white horses and we're going to follow him and we're going to come back. He's going to come back. And when he comes back, the Bible says that he's going to take the Antichrist and the false prophet, and they're the first two going into the lake of fire. Pew. But the devil is going to be put into the abyss. He is locked up in the bottomless pit. 
that for a thousand years, the people of God will reign on this earth and Jesus will reign with a rod of iron. And we've seen what man can do. Now we're going to see what God can do. Now at the end of the thousand years, the Bible says, and it's in Revelation chapter 20, at the end of the thousand years, Satan will be loosed. And those children that have been born during that 1,000 years that have not been redeemed or asked Christ to come into heart because they're still born into sin, they have to be saved. Those that aren't saved will join Satan in rebellion. And at the end of this, Jesus says, that's enough. It's all done. Gave you a final chance. That's it. And he's going to take the devil. And where does he go? Goes to the lake of fire. Amen. And... uh, This is in Revelation 19 and 20 and uh, chapter 20 uh, and and then 21. So um, let me let me pick this up at Revelation 20:10. And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, shall be tormented day and night, forever and forever. Why would I not want to preach on fire and brimstone? That's where the devil's going. Amen. You want to follow the devil? You want to do what the devil does? That's where you're going to end up too. Verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Woo. So the earth and the heaven go away. They flee away. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. So in other words, those that are lost would stand before God one final time. They would come out of hell. They're not in the lake of fire. They're in holding in hell and torment, but they would stand before God, and an angel would say, look in the book of life one more time. Let's, let's see if Jimmy John is in there. Jimmy John, God, we've, we've looked. Jimmy John's not in here. Sorry, Jimmy John. Your name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You never gave your heart to Jesus. But I went to church. I took a nap. I gave a quarter. Jimmy John, you never gave your heart to Jesus. Your name was never written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You don't see it. Final appeal. Jimmy John needs to go to the lake of fire. Jimmy John didn't want God in his life, so he'll spend eternity without God in his life. No, I'm making this stuff up. Why would I want to do that? And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first death were passed away, and there was no more sea. That's the back end of the bookend. The previous creation that had been tainted by sin, this earth, these heavens that had been tainted by sin are going to burn up by fire. And God will make a brand new heaven and a new earth. And that bookend. So what starts it? The rapture. What ends it? The old being destroyed in a new heaven and a new earth ends what we would term the day of the Lord. Okay, so it's not just one day, it is the day of the Lord. And it, and it explains the judgment that's coming. So what he does is he comes up in verse 11 of, of 2 Peter 3, and he says, so seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, your house is going to burn up. Your car is going to burn up. Your boat's going to burn up. This earth is going to burn up. It's not not going to be anything left. Seeing that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens shall be on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So he says, knowing and understanding what's coming should that not make you want to straighten up and fly right? That's what my mother would say. You better straighten up and fly right. You did that, you knew you were going to get a whooping. <laughs> it would be about like lunchtime. And me and my brother, we would fight. We fought all the time. It was an Olympic sport in our house. But we were always wrestling and didn't know when to stop. And 
Mom would say, y'all need to stop it, and we wouldn't stop, and we'd just keep on fighting. And finally, she'd say, I'm going to tell you, Daddy, when he gets home from work, he's going to beat you. He's going to come in, and he's going to be tired and wore out and dirty, hungry, and before he gets to sit down in his lazy boy, before he gets a bite of food, I'm going to tell on you. I'm going to tell him what mean little devils you two have been, that you wouldn't behave, that you would not uh, uh, mind me, and judgment is coming. <laughs> and brother, knowing what judgment was coming, the shenanigans stopped. If we do right, we might get mercy. If we go to mom and bring her flowers and, and mop the floor and clean the kitchen and, 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 and help out without being asked to, maybe, just maybe she won't tell on us. Maybe she'll have mercy. Maybe we won't get beat after death when my daddy walks in the door. Because if we act like a fool, Katie barred the door. Judgment coming and it's just going to get worse if we act foolish. Amen? So don't say, don't tell me about the fire and brimstone. Brother, I wanted to know. I wanted to know what's coming. Maybe I could cut it off. I wanted to know my daddy was going to come and beat me. I could prepare. I could stick something down in my britches. I could make my peace with God. I want to know. I can steer here my daddy's belt zipping from every loop. Pop, 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 pop. And with one hand he's grabbing at me and the other hand he's folding that belt. And brother Zorro couldn't whoop somebody as good as my daddy could with that belt. I wanted to know. You need to tell me you're going to tattle on me. That's what Peter's saying. God's telling you, judgment's coming, knucklehead. Straighten up and fly right. Start having a Bible study. Start treating your wife right. Start tithing. Start coming on a regular basis. Go on a mission trip. Knucklehead, judgment's coming. Oh. They say one way to catch a monkey is to find a hollow tree trunk and take a drill and drill a hole in the tree trunk just big enough for the monkey to stick his hand through the hole and then put some candy and some treats down in the hollow tree trunk so that the monkey would come along and he'd look down in there and he'd see a piece of candy like a Tootsie Roll. So he reaches his hand down in there and grabs all that Tootsie Roll and tries to pull his hand out, but with his fist clenched, he can't. He's holding on that Tootsie Roll. He won't let go of the Tootsie Roll, but he can't get his hand out. He's not smart enough to let it go and get out. And the hunter literally can walk up to him with a baseball bat and just bop him on the head because the monkey's too stupid to let go of the Tootsie Roll. The Bible says, listen, Christian, you're not children of the dark, you're children of the light. You ought to be seeing the signs. You ought to be studying the signs. You ought to be going. Because the gun's about to go off. The book end starts. And judgment's coming. Judgment of reward for Christian. Judgment of fire and brimstone for unbelievers. If you're still in that position of going, I don't even know if I'm a believer. I don't know if I've given my heart to Jesus. I've come to church. I just don't know. You, you need to make it sure. You need to make your calling and election sure. You need to grab hold of one of these deacons, one of these Sunday school teachers, or, or, or one of these ladies in the women's ministry and say, I need to know. Would you pray with me? Can you show me some scriptures? I need to know. And brother, if there's some sin in your life, listen, monkey, you better let go of it. And pull your hand out and get away from it because it's a trap. And the devil's really good at trapping Christians. You better let go of it. 
So that's 2 Peter chapter 3, the warnings that we've received from Almighty God. Amen. And that's just about all the voice I've got. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you all to stand up. And I so appreciate y'all's teachable spirit. Y'all are so much fun. I love Wednesday night. My goodness gracious. Don't y'all love Wednesday night? I was wondering if y'all did. (laughs) I know. But I've seen people come and go to sleep here. Uh, All right. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Um, let's see. Howard Crutzinger, would you do me a favor, please, sir, and lead us to the throne?